Jared, many of my cosmology friends like to talk about what human beings will be like in not a hundred years, but a billion years. And there's some very interesting discussions we can have. Some of your work seems to indicate that we better worry about what's happening in the next few decades or we'll never get there. What is collapse all about? I would say to your cosmology friends, don't waste your time discussing a billion years from now. Don't waste your time discussing 150 years from now. The only interesting thing is what's going to happen to the world in the next 30 to 50 years, because at the end of 30 to 50 years, it'll all get settled. Either within the next 50 years, we figure out how to get onto a sustainable course, and we figure out how to promote roughly equal standards of living around the world, and we do it in 50 years, or if we fail to do it in 50 years, the world is going downhill and collapses of societies will spread so that the conditions that now prevail in Haiti and Somalia, where there's not a functioning state government, that will be not just in Haiti, Somalia, but around the world if we don't solve our problems in the next 50 years. So your cosmologists are worrying about a billion years from now. That's a bag of tail. Forget about it. <laughs> All right, let, let's understand how collapse works. Uh, what are some examples that you've used in terms of human societies that have collapsed? And then what can you generalize from that and apply it today? Famous societies of, famous examples of human societies that have collapsed that are famous because their tourist attractions are the Maya civilizations of the southern lowland Yucatan, the big Maya cities like Tikal and Palenque and, and Copan. This, this was not some primitive tribal society. This was the most advanced society in the New World before Columbus, and yet they collapsed. They abandoned their cities beginning around AD 800, famous collapse. Easter Island, that isolated island in the Pacific Ocean, mm -hmm. famous for the gigantic <clears throat> statues. Those people figured out how to carve and transport 90-ton statues, which is an achievement if you don't have wheels and draft animals. But they eventually deforested their whole island, and they ended up in warfare pulling down each other's statues and collapsed. At this point, you may be starting to think, well, collapse is something that happens only to, to exotic people mm -hmm. like Native Americans and Easter Islanders. But it can also happen to Europeans. The, the, the Vikings who went out and colonized Iceland and attacked England and Normandy and then settled Greenland. So they set up a, in AD 984, they found a Christian literate society in Greenland. They built a cathedral and stone churches and they import wine and bells mm -hmm. back and forth. And 450 years later, they're all dead and they left Greenland to the Inuit because the Greenland Norse did not figure out how to operate a self-sustaining society in Greenland even though they were literate Christian Europeans. So what are some characteristics that, that, uh, that uh, societies have done which have generated the collapse? What, what can you uh, induce from each of these isolated examples? You can deduce the problems that they encountered and you can deduce the mindset characteristics that resulted in their making preventable mistakes. Okay. The problems that they encountered are a mixture of five problems that bring societies down. In no particular order, their enemies, so military problems, their friends, your friendly trade partners who make mistakes and stop providing you stuff that you need, such as the Gulf oil crisis. Their climate change, whether caused by humans or natural in the past, the environmental problems that you, that you inadvertently chop down all your trees and exterminate your cod fisheries and, yeah. and get rid of your water and topsoil, and then there are your social and economic and political institutions that prevent you from solving these problems. So those are the five sets of problems. And then there are the mental problems. Why on earth did the Easter Islanders not recognize that they were, <laughs> this is a wood dependent society. Why on earth did they chop down their last tree? <laughs> but you could ask, we Americans, we are, we are a topsoil and an oil dependent society. And 
and we are a fish dependent society. Why are we exterminating our fisheries and why are we depleting our topsoil and why are we operating an unsustainable energy budget? Mm -hmm. And uh, how many of those five characteristics uh, do you see happening uh, in the contemporary world, whether it's in America or Asian countries that are coming on stronger, Europe? Uh, how do you see those five characteristics? Everybody knows that all five characteristics are operating. Does the United States have enemies? Yes, we have mm. enemies who would love to wipe us out. Does the United States have friendly trade partners, some of whom are unstable <laughs> and might collapse or get into difficulties? Yes, we do. Um, does the United States face climate change today? Yes, we do. Here in California and where I spend my summers in Montana, yes, we have climate change, which is a big economic problem. Does the United States overharvest resources on which we depend, such as soil and water and forests? Yes, we do. And does the United States have maladaptive economic, political, and social institutions? <laughs> yes, we do. So all well, five issues are with us. Well, it sounds like the last one is, is, is the most prevalent that we, that we all feel. Um, but uh, it, it would seem like even if they are that way, we can sort of muddle along in the, in the current way that it won't lead literally to a collapse, which uh, in the examples that you use, the Eastern Island, the Eastern, uh, Island example, it, it's, it's such a small area that if you do cut down all the trees, I, you can understand that. But you, you really, it, when you're dealing with larger, more complex societies, it seems like those principles uh, wouldn't have that dramatic impact. A larger society that occupies a larger area needs more time to muck up its environment than does a small society. But in our favor of mucking up in the environment is that we have far more potent technology than the Easter Islanders. It took the Easter Islanders about 700 years to chop down every tree on their island of 64 square miles. But today we have chainsaws and nuclear power, and we are succeeding. We are in the process of deforesting the whole world faster than the Easter Islanders deforested their little island. So um, if, if you had your crystal ball, what would you predict? I, I predict that the chances are 51% that we'll solve our problems and 49% that, that we won't. Well, but to be very literal, though, in, in, with those percentages, what, is, what does that mean if we solve our problems or if we don't? What, what does that literally mean? It, literally, solving our problems means adopting a sustainable economy, a sustainable use of resources that can go on forever, at present, our economy is unsustainable in that we are depleting our fisheries of topsoil. But we know perfectly well how to farm sustainably. We know how to manage fisheries sustainably. We manage some fisheries sustainably. Alaska wild salmon is managed sustainably. All that we have to do is manage all the other fisheries the way that we manage Alaska wild salmon. So that's one thing we have to do. And the other thing we have to do is that the world is not going to be viable or sustainable. Um, when there's massive inequality between the world's peoples. Because today, especially since September 11, 2001, when some people are unhappy, even if they're out there in Afghanistan, they have ways of, sh of sharing their unhappiness with the rest of the world. So the only stable society decades from now is gonna be a society that is harvesting resources sustainably, and it's going to be a society in which standards of living are relatively equal all around the world. You put a great deal of emphasis on the economics, the standard of living, but is it not the case that those who would attack the United States, some would do it for ideological reasons that have no relationship to their economic standing? Uh, the uh, September 11th uh, uh, suicide bombers, uh, many of them were engineers. Uh, that's correct. Uh, people frequently cite that and it's misleading. Uh, yes, some of the crazies themselves are highly intelligent, educated people, but every country has its crazies. The United States had its Timothy McVeigh and Theodore Kaczynski, and Norway has now had its crazy who killed the 75 kids, and Italy had its Brigate Rosse, and Germany had its Baden Mayhoff guy. The difference, so the crazies are educated, but what counts is whether the whole society gives support to its educated crazies. And in a, in a happy, prosperous society, the United States did not support Timothy McVeigh, but a desperate society like Afghanistan did support Osama bin Laden.